even louder. Um, cool, so before we jump into actual the, the data and a lot of the fun stuff, um, I wanted to start at the top and, and introduce the, the global e-commerce market as it is today. Because a lot has changed even over the last year. Um, in 2019, e-commerce is uh, forecasted to be $3.5 trillion. So it's $3.5 trillion US dollars in commerce that's going to happen globally on the internet. Um, if we take a step back and think about that for a little bit, that's 50% more than the GDP of France as an entire country. Literally all of France, everything they produce, this is 50% uh, more than that. Um, so e-commerce has really come a very long way over the last couple of years. And if I were to present this 10 years ago, the numbers would be in the millions, not in the trillions. But I wanted to start here at the top just so we have a frame of reference of, of where we're at. Um, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a geo breakdown. So we're going to look geographically at three different areas. We're going to look at the Americas. We're going to look at Europe, Middle East, Africa, and we're going to look at Asia Pacific. And throughout these slides, I'm going to do a little, a, a couple exercises to make sure everyone's still following me and everyone's still awake. Uh, so this is going to be our first one. So e-commerce uh, total sales in 2019. So this is the 3.5 trillion dollar number that I mentioned at the start. So globally, we're at 3.5 trillion dollars. Um, out of these three markets, and I kept the image at the bottom, although you can probably see it, but. Um, you have the Americas, you have uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and then you have Asia Pacific. Uh, raise of hands, uh, we'll start from this one. Who thinks that this, uh, which, the question is which area has the most e-commerce sales? So globally we're at 3.5 trillion. The question is which one has the highest amount? So we're gonna start with the, with the first one, which is Asia Pacific. Raise of hands, who, has, who thinks Asia Pacific has Asia the lot? Does it include China? Oh, no. China uh, Asia Pacific yeah. does include them. Yeah. 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 Good, so three quarters, uh, hands go up. Uh, Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa. We've got three hands and Americas. We've got five hands. You guys are actually good at this. Um, <laughs> Asia Pacific represents not only more, but literally the majority. It's, it's uh, almost three quarters of global e-commerce is currently happening in Asia, in Asia Pacific. And if you think about it, I'll, I could go back to a bigger picture of the map. Um, it's not only India that you have in here, you have China, you have Hong Kong, you have Japan. Um, but that's that's a crazy amount. It's funny. I've I, I've done this uh, chart, this exercise with different audiences. And people who are from the U.S. usually think literally <laughs> everyone's <laughs> like no, all the hands go off. All the hands go off. That America has the, the biggest amount, but it's it's uh, it's not even close. Um, Asia Pacific, what is it? Three times more than the, than the Americans for for uh, for e-commerce total sales. Cool. One more exercise for you guys. Same same regions are going to look at. So this is e-commerce percent of of total sales. Mm -hmm. So all of the sales that happen within that region, what percent happen online is the question. Same exercise. Who thinks Asia Pacific is the highest? So raise of hands. Four hands up. Uh, Europe, Middle, Middle East, and Africa. A couple more hands, and then we have uh, Americans. Yeah. Uh, almost, almost the entire room. <laughs> this one, this one, you guys are gonna be surprised. Oh, with. Oh, oh, okay. um, so America is actually the American uh, church should be this yeah. part yeah. should be a little bit lower. Um, uh, the 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 percent uh, Asia um, Asia Pacific is still the highest, and uh, if you think about that, it makes sense uh, when you go to like Japan, Hong Kong, all those areas, people are just so much more apt to do all their transactions online. Uh, the reason I go through this exercise, and this, this needs to be fixed, um, is that uh, there's huge, huge opportunities everywhere. If, if, uh, if you think of it on a, on a bigger scale, even Asia Pacific at 22%, what a huge, huge opportunity, it's huge amounts uh, of transactions that are not happening online that will be, right? If we look at this in 10 years from now, I promise you that everything will be much, much higher, right? It's, it's not gonna be double, everything's gonna be quadruple. So tons and tons of opportunities globally, 14%, so 
globally only 14% of all uh, of all commerce is happening online right now. Um, and the change has been huge. Uh, the, these numbers, even though they seem small, 10 years ago, they were all single digits. Yes, question. Sorry, just a quick yeah. question. Because you can order, like, basically internationally around the world, is it considered the country of origin or the country of delivery? This is the country of delivery. Okay. So this is where the consumer is. Thank you. Yeah, good question. But just okay. another question. Yeah. Population, if you look at the Asia side of it, if you work out that as a percentage to their total sales in that country, it might give a different story because you've got more people in that country. Yes, yes, yes. That's why the, the, this is a, a better way to look at it as a, as a, as a raw percent because this is this the, the yeah. takes uh, this doesn't take into account the population. But yeah, definitely. Uh, this one also, when presenting to to uh, an audience <coughs> within the U.S., people think, for some reason, especially younger people think that in the U.S. If I ask like raw numbers. Uh, uh, for for a younger audience in the U.S., they feel like 80% happens online, right? Um, and maybe for 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 uh, the younger demographics, it is. But uh, globally, that's that's where we're at right now. But these are all going to change, and that's why uh, that's why we're here talking about all this stuff because this is this is really powerful. That we're still at such an early stage in all of this, and a lot of people feel like they've missed out in digital in 2019, 2020, but we're not even close to missing out. Sorry, yes. Alex, but I mean, the point that you're saying now is actually a relevant one. So if you yes. look at the European and even EMAE, the youth population compared to Asia yes. is a different profile. And we know Much that, and if one yeah. looks at where the digital space is going, the younger your population, the more likely e-commerce yes, is, is expected to have that Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. excessive Absolutely. growth. Absolutely. Yeah. The younger population will drive this, yeah. for sure. All right, so let's talk about the, the actual digital consumer. And this, this is also something that's changed a lot over the, the last couple of years. And I've, I've talked about uh, digital, digital in, in general, digital advertising, digital consumers for over a decade now. And it's come a really, really long way. So I'll just go through some general information just to, we could, we could frame our, uh, our discussion and see where we're at right now in, uh, 2019 heading in 2020. So the user journey. So a lot. Of, before we jump in, I'll preface this that a lot of this data is U.S. based, but I, I think it's very uh, relevant worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, in a lot of regions, for for this kind of information, are a couple of years behind of the U.S., but not not as far behind as they used to be. Um, so. Not all, but almost all of that is U.S. based. But I think it's it, it, it's still very relevant. Um, by uh, so this is from a PwC did a survey. They said that uh, each person in the U.S. is going to have seven connected devices by 2020. Um, yeah. Seven okay. connected. If you think of it, your Alexa, your phone, yes. your iPad, laptop, laptop, it's so laptop, quick, yeah. laptop it's cell phone. They now sell TVs that that are connected yeah, to the internet, right? Yeah. Your TV, yeah, your, the, your, your, your refrigerator, TV, yeah, your, your, your refrigerator could do the shopping yeah. for you, right? They have the new fridges. You can make it like <laughs> <orders>. <laughs> <laughs> you run out of milk. It, it's it's yeah. funny, but they, they literally have it now. You run out of milk, they'll order the milk for you. Your your the, your refrigerator is a connected device. Yeah. Uh, seven number of connected devices per person by 2020. Next one, you guys are are, are gonna like too. Um, this is by a very very big uh, uh, study that was done as well, and this was actually a fairly recent one. Uh, this is uh, this is a worldwide connected devices. So right now, in 2019, there's 11 billion. So these are devices that are connected to the internet worldwide. 2020 is expected to be 20 billion, almost wow. double. Sure, yeah. that's significant. And and again, I, I have a lot of conversations where uh, or uh, either conferences or or uh, talking to companies where they're like. Man, it's almost 2020. I really missed out on this digital thing. Like it's already like the growth already happened. It's gonna literally, it's literally doubling the amount of connected devices. I don't know if you guys seen yet, uh, along with obviously smartwatches and all of that that's now been out. Uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon now has a smart ring. If you guys haven't seen it, you could Google it. It, oh, wow. they, they sell a connected uh, ring that it has uh, Alexa built in that you could ask. Oh, the heart, so cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you literally talk, you talk to it. You know, like, yeah. So, awesome. this, this, this is going to be huge. You guys continue to keep going. track your husband. It's for the husband. Yeah. <laughs> big, big market. <laughs> um, oh, my. Okay. 
consumer expectations are changing. So this is data from Google. So we have we, we do a lot of work with Google. We have a very good partnership with them. They they share a lot of this really cool data and they do a lot of a lot of really cool studies. Uh, as the consumers are much more curious now, uh, fifty five percent growth in searches for ideas. So as opposed to uh, ten years ago, people used the internet more more of like a yellow pages or a directory. They would go on and say, I want to find a plumber. Uh, now people are looking for ideas, they're trying to solve things themselves, they're looking for uh, information, it's become uh, a lot, there's a lot more more different and diverse searches going on. Um, people have become more impatient. Um, I don't know if that's globally in the US for sure, I've seen this. Um, and, and Amazon's to blame for, for this one a little bit. Uh, people in the e-commerce e space expect uh, same day shipping. Uh, it's crazy because uh, when Amazon started offering it, um, everyone thought it was a joke and they wouldn't succeed with it. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did, did they succeed with it, now consumers are expect, expecting it. So definitely something to keep in mind. It's, it's uh, much harder to get away with saying to a consumer that you'll order the item now, you'll get it in two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, before the internet, that was no, no one would blink an eye. People would wait a month to get something, right? Now people are much more impatient. Um, and more than anything, so one in three expect personalization. So uh, also driven by Amazon and a couple other other companies, but uh, consumers now expect you to give them recommendations. So when they're, if you think about it, if you shop on Amazon, if you're looking, for example, for a, a camera, right? You expect Amazon to recommend to you the memory card to buy with it, the battery to buy with it, and the camera stand to buy with it. Um, so not only is, is Amazon doing that to get more sales, right? Consumers expect, expect and demand that. And if your site doesn't do it, not only will you lose out on those sales, you'll probably lose out on that consumer as well. So these are all, uh, this is not a snapshot, this is literally the, the big changes that happened in the last couple of years and just something to keep, keep in mind. Yes? Do you mind if we interrupt on Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, uh, interrupt. Yeah. Definitely. So, I mean, this this was quite a big question for us in our business, so I'm challenging yes. my directors on it. Is retail still retail or is retail supply chain? And which strategy needs to be aligned to which? Because if you look at Amazon, their business strategy is a supply chain model. They just happen to sell goods. Yes. And, and less and less they sell, less and less goods are more of a marketplace now. So, so if you look at that way of thinking and that way of strategizing, the capex that they have invested, I mean, they haven't taken any profits out yon year, they've just been reinvesting, reinvesting. Uh, where does that leave the actual retailing space going forward? Because the amount of investment that one needs to do to try and compete with the expectation of the customer that Amazon has created <laughs> almost takes you out of business. So maybe that's just what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's 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 it's, it's a good question. It's very tricky. So we, we work with a lot of companies that sell both on Amazon and on their own website. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best example because those companies have the choice and they, they have both platforms that they, they, they can compare. I'll tell you that in a lot of cases they have to be on Amazon just because that's where the consumer goes. Yeah. Because if they're not on Amazon they won't be discovered. Uh, but after that initial purchase, they try really hard to get the consumer to go to their website instead. Um, so there's definitely strategies. There's a, I, I, as a, for the Amazon example, I think you have to be on Amazon in the e-commerce space as long as you can and it's affordable to you and the ROIs make sense uh, just for discoverability. Um, but it's, 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 it's definitely a um, much different marketplace now than 10 years ago. Ten years ago, uh, it was a lot more uh, accepted yeah. to just have your own website and just sell your own product and not participate in these marketplaces. So the question really is, where does it leave the traditional retailer? The traditional retailer has to get a lot more creative in mm -hmm. finding the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. And this this has become the this has become marketers' jobs. No longer yes. are we advertising. Our job today is discoverability and yes. driving the consumer further down into the funnel. Um, and getting them to consider. So it's, yes. it, the, our jobs are no longer to say, look at how shiny and great our product is. Is, is We know you're looking for shiny and great products. We would like for you to discover ours yeah. because you are considering it and then get you to shop it. You have to become, uh, that's exactly it, and you have to become a lot, a lot better, and this goes perfectly into my slides a little later. Um, 
you have to get really, really good at knowing your consumer and targeting your Absolutely. consumer. You can't run blanket ads anymore that yeah. target everyone and hope yeah. that someone yeah. like like uh, you catch yeah. someone, yeah. right? In South Africa, uh, we call it spray and pray. <laughs> what was it? Spray, 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 spray and pray. Spray and pray. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have to, yeah, yeah. You have to just have a lot more precision now. Uh, you know, and, and that kind of level of precision would have always been good. But ten years away, you would get away w without it. You would get away with a spray and pray. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in 2019, 2020, and forward, you just won't because the, the more your competitors do it, the, the faster you'll go out of business. Yeah. Um, and I'll get into actually some good ways to do that later on, and some good examples for that. Um, any other questions on this before we move on? Next slide is also a good one. Uh, consumer path to purchase. This used to be very, very linear. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about yourself 10 years ago, you would uh, look something up, you would buy. That was the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, now you see a social media ad, you look up the brand, you watch their video, you actually make the purchase, but then you pick it up in store and then you leave your review after. Um, if you think about, uh, for example, this is even a simplistic one. I have one of these that, that uh, I do for the auto industry and I do a lot of speaking events. We do a lot in the auto space and deal with a lot of auto brands. I have one of these for the auto industry. An average consumer has 28 touch points from deciding to buy a car to buying a car. <coughs> from going to the, to the actual car manufacturer's website to looking up dealerships to comparing cars to looking up reviews to watching YouTube videos checking out their cell phone, and then on top of everything, except especially for the auto guys, 50% of the consumers, they're already at the dealership. They've decided what car they want. They decide they're buying it from that dealership. Yep. They're physically standing in their dealership. Yep. They're gonna take out their cell phone, and they're gonna do a final price check to see if they see any special deals or pricing. They're already at the dealership, talking to a salesperson, right? Salesperson's convinced they're buying it from them. They're gonna take out their device, and they're gonna do a search right there, 50% of consumers. Um, so the, the purchase, the, the, the path to purchase has become completely nonlinear. It's a very, very important to understand this both for attribution analysis and both for your, your, your path of, the, uh, of where you're going to impact them. So literally, if you draw this out for a typical consumer, it's going to look different for every, every single industry. Uh, you could really think about where you want to uh, try to impact them and draw them to your, to your site, to your, to your product. Uh, for example, in the auto space, if someone is deciding between uh, 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 Honda and Toyota, right? So they they haven't picked a car yet. They're literally just deciding, do I want a Honda or do I want a Toyota? As a dealership, that might not be your place to get the most impact because are, are you as a small Honda dealership going to convince them not to buy a Toyota? It's going to be a hard pull. That, that should be on, on the name brand, like a Honda and Toyota's marketing, right? So you decide that where is the place that you want to impact them. They already decided they want a Honda. They, they decide the model. They're picking this between dealerships. This is where I want to impact them. I know they're going to be on a mobile device. This is what I want to do. So it's very important to kind of draw this out for your typical consumer. Cool. Any questions with this? Sorry, I have yes. I've got a question. No between problem. what would, if you had a limited budget, between social and search, um, and I know that it depends on what kind of product you're selling, because I mean, Google bidding has become it's become expensive yeah. to, to bid in words, especially in the sector in which I work in. Would you, where would you go if you had really limited budget and you really had to, wanted to convert? Would you go social or would you go search? Good question. So I think that the simple answer is it should always be data driven, mm -hmm. what, what the data shows. But uh, it's, it's hard. You have to invest the money to get the data yeah, to make the decision yeah. and then everything shifts already. Yeah. Um, personally, we, so as an agency, we do, on, on, on behalf of our, our clients, we spend the same $25 million with Google and $25 million with Facebook. So we're, we're pretty even in terms of spend. Uh, for most, uh, in most cases, Google will still give you a, a better bank for your buck. Um, if you want to do like brand awareness type of campaigns, like if you're like Pepsi or Coke, uh, social media is very powerful. Um, and I, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you why Google is still powerful, even though it costs so much more. Um, if you come home and you're in your uh, and your pipe burst and it's leaking in the basement, right? It's leaking, the water is all over the place. You're gonna take you out your cell phone. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna search plumber, right? Um, with Facebook, you to, to get that person, you'd have to work really, really hard 
to identify the right audience and Facebook will use their algorithm mm -hmm. to think maybe that person's in the market right now, right? And even if they are in Facebook, you could catch them late. You, you have the right mm -hmm. audience, but they already made a purchase. So you're, you're showing ads to someone who just bought your product or someone else's product that they're no longer in market. So Google's still so much more powerful because of the, the uh, it depends on the industry, but anything anything that has any kind of urgency, Google will, will still by far the, the best answer. Because people literally just take out their cell phone and search. Uh, Facebook is better at, at uh, trying to move awareness, increase awareness, increase favorability, like those kind of metrics. And you could use that to ultimately drive sales, but it's a lot trickier. Mm -hmm. So, so the simple answer is, is, is it depends on okay. the ur no on the urgency. It it it, de it depends on a lot of things. I I I'd love for all those decisions to be data driven yeah. as opposed to gut driven. Uh, but for most of our clients, uh, Google performs better than Facebook. Just a lot more expensive. Yeah. It's a lot more expensive, but they still get it. even though it's more expensive, they get better ROI than yeah. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yes. So maybe just a follow up on that because, yeah. I mean, as consumer behavior changes, it's changing rapidly based on yes. technology and your savviness with the level of technology and your social awareness. So, I mean, how much data does one need to store and how often would you want to change your strategy yeah. to be in the right place at the right time? Data, you should store everything. Um, luckily, a lot of third party Third-party services like Google Analytics will store for you and we'll get into some good data stuff after because uh, that's the first thing when I talk to companies First thing I tell them to make sure they're storing the data and storing everything and they're like Oh, I don't want to start marketing for another six months. So you still you, that's the first step first step is always to store data uh, How often should you, should you be changing strategies? It depends on your marketplace um, in the auto space You don't have to be as quick because things are slower moving uh, some industries are a lot quicker moving though, so it's it, it, it all depends on your industry um, um, There's also every industry has has uh, has seasonality and holidays So there's definitely I wouldn't keep the same strategy if you're if you're in e-commerce I wouldn't keep the same strategy in July as you would in December for example mm, well, uh, In terms of uh, actually like without the seasonality how often you should reevaluate it uh, I'd say every two to three months would be good. Wow. Sure. That's it's fast moving. It didn't used to be that. In in the uh, in early '90s, um, bigger big companies would would use strategy. They would come up with a strategy and use it for like ten years, right? And yeah, it'd be yeah. fine. It'd be fine. It worked. Now it's just uh, there's so much more data, and and companies are are just trying to outcompete each other literally by by data and agility. Yeah. Um, they just have to try to keep up with that. I think if you say the customer is very demanding now, it forces you to, to kind of challenge that, you know, challenge company to effectively have long-term strategies yeah. as well. Because if they want it, they want it now, you can't wait for, you know, I would say even three months could be even quite hectic. Yes. If you say speak to market, you need to think now. Yes. You can't, you can't wait. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, but again, so, so I'm going to keep on bringing back, because we are for retail and the strategy of retail, Mm -hmm. And in South Africa, because we do a high percentage of imports for our apparel, mm -hmm. uh, it takes you six months to get that stock. So you're actually planning your season six months in advance. And if the data is changing at this rapid pace, surely it's going to put significant um, impact on our government as well as our sector to start seeing how to in-house and how to shorten that lead times to get the right product yeah. to market. So I think even even if your product takes six months to arrive, I don't think you could plan out the marketing strategy at that point. Mm -hmm. I think you have to yeah. be planning out much sooner to deliver mm -hmm. uh, because things change so rapidly. Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 just the key. Even even if you know the product's not, or even if you don't know what the product is, you could already start <coughs> doing basic research mm -hmm. closer to the. And hopefully it comes in time and everything comes together it becomes a lot more challenging yeah for sure but to be honest we don't change product often we change strategies yeah, sure. that are linked to commerce often yes. you wear jeans as much as you wear jeans as much as you wear jeans whether they've got you know, it should, the, the whatever, style uh, you know. style should not change your overall strategy Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you start That's messing it. around with price points yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. demographics may be a little yeah. bit yep. i have actually a good example for you for, for fashion a couple of slides down uh, final one in consumer. 
Uh, again, it's just something to keep in mind. This is comparing this source thing got deleted, but uh, I think this is comparing 2017, 2013, uh, changing in consumers. Uh, brand loyalty is down 60%. Uh, consumers are a lot, lot, lot less loyal than they've ever been, ever. And the younger you go, the typically the less loyal you are. Um, fashion is no different. Uh, higher end fashion, there's still some loyalty in. Uh, lower to middle end, uh, if, if they could get the looks, something that looks similar for twice cheaper, they're, they're going to do it. Um, digital influence is 75% uh, more important. Um, and again, this is, a, I think, comparing it to three years ago. Uh, a lot more important for them to research the company style brand online, and that impacts their decision more than anything else. If you think about 10 years ago, uh, all the studies of, of uh, what's, what's important for influence, um, people's friends and family were always number one for almost any decision. From, from what jeans they bought to uh, what car they bought. It was always uh, friends and family. Are these US stats? Hmm? Are these are US stats or global? These are uh, US. Okay. But I think they're mostly yeah. applicable. Maybe not such high yeah. swings, but they're mostly applicable. Yeah. Um, and profitability, this is for all of e-commerce, uh, omni-retailers uh, in the US. Uh, profitability is actually down. Yeah. So with all these challenges, on top of that, you get hit with lower profitability. Yes. Gary, you almost wonder who's going to be in business after that. Uh, exactly. Um, that's Sorry, questions? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you spoke about um, payroll. Mm -hmm. Does that include food as well? Does it include food? Are we still seeing payroll in food? In what? In food. 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 Uh, if you see change. Um, much less. Also, brand loyalty across the board's down. Um, even even car brands struggle with it. A lot of people would be, especially, I, I don't have as much experience internationally as the US, but in the US, for example, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of people were very, very brand loyal. People would buy the same brand car. Yeah. They didn't care that the car got worse, yeah. or like it lost a feature or something, like this is my, this is my third Cadillac, mm -hmm. I love it, like, it's in, uh, oh, my dad had a Cadillac, I'm gonna get a Cadillac, so it was very, uh, uh, the auto industry itself taught people to buy within the same brand, like GM, GM did very well, and so the Ford, literally they had a hierarchy. When you first gave first cars a Chevy, mm -hmm. then you move move on to a Buick, and then you get, like literally they built yeah. this, people had the loyalty, they stayed with her. Mm -hmm. Now that loyalty is not there, people jump around cars. But our businesses now know in terms of the brand loyalty trying to then lock you down. I mean, if, if you see with, with us in the Mercedes Benz, they've got different ways of financing you to say over time you can keep. Yes. Because I guess now their strategy has to be how do we keep yes. people loyal? How do we lock customers? Yeah, so loyal, loyalty is in zero, mm -hmm. it's just down, and mm -hmm. now you have to work a lot harder at innovation. Keeping your consumer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. But, but again, if you come back to the social environment, because this is what is, is driving a lot of this transformation. So before, it was a very much group thing, yes. and very much um, family and influence by your family in that decision making. Yes. Whereas at the moment, with the younger generation X, I don't know if it's I or whatever they name it, <laughs> they're going to a lot more individualization, and it's very about me. So the, the reality of trying to keep them satisfied and keep them loyal to a brand when things are changing at a rapid pace is going to become even more and more difficult. Yes, yes, and it's already probably over the last five years it's become a lot more difficult and it's going to become even more difficult. Um, is it about whoever can give you the little pink dot on the right corner where you want it versus the pink dot the on the bottom left, that instant gratification exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, right now. Okay. Digital advertising. So that was that was uh, we talked about e-commerce uh, in general. We talked about the consumer, and now we're actually going to talk about advertising. And then after that, we're going to talk about the actual data and how you could use that. Um, this is also so. The next the next two slides have have been a presentation in itself. So obviously digital advertising is a very big topic and you could talk about it for hours. I narrowed it down, I think literally I just have two, <laughs> two slides for you guys. But uh, again, it's just to frame uh, frame everyone's thinking and to to understand where, where we're coming from and where we are. And this is going to be US data, but the whole world's following all of this. 
Uh, so it's going to be very similar. This is uh, where your consumers are spending their time. Uh, again, this is for the US, but I imagine uh, globally, if it's not like this yet, it will be very soon. Uh, this is how many hours per day the consumer spends on each media. So for those that are in the back, this is TV, digital, radio, print, and other. Uh, and this is 2012, this is 2016, this is 2018 forecast. So the actual was even a bigger change. Uh, so for TV, people used to spend, and this is 2012, so it was a six, six years ago from, there's a six year difference from these two. People used to spend four hours, almost 40 minutes on TV per day, now it's three hours, 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, people who are even spending the 355, and I know very few people spend this much time watching TV, usually holding their cell phone while doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So not only is there a decrease, there's still uh, on, uh, in this section. Uh, digital, uh, we've gone from four hours to six. Biggest increase actually from here to here was mobile. Uh, this is from 2016, 2018. I have this in another deck broken out. Mobile just exploded here. People are just spending a lot more time. Um, and the exercise I usually do, and you guys are traveling, so it's not fair, but the exercise I do is I, I ask the, the, the crowd, uh, how many people in the room spend three hours watching TV today? How many people spend three, three hours on their computer or cell phone? Almost no one spends three hours on TV, everyone's on their, on their computer or cell phone. Uh, radio is mostly flat down a little bit, print, prints down a little bit. In the US, a lot of uh, print companies have gone out of business in the last couple of years, literally because of that. Uh, the, the last couple of years hasn't been a, a big drop because a lot of print companies finally embrace digital and they put their content on digital. But this is literally why they went out of business. From 2012 to 2016, uh, the amount of time people spend on print, the amount of time people read newspapers and all of that just took a huge drop. A little different for us on TV and so that. Mm -hmm. It's still hot. It's still hot, yes. Um, uh, I think that even aside from South Africa, I, I, I did a similar session in Europe. Mm -hmm. It was different from in Europe yeah. also, but they, they're they starting to notice. No, no, we can see it. We can definitely but see not, it. But not, not as, not as the, 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 the similarities are in print. We've had actually a few publications closed down completely. Mm -hmm. Some have. In the US, that, yeah, in the US that happened like five yeah. years ago was yeah. the big, big drop off. Yeah, and then. Radio is quite interesting for us because of our traffic time. So that one to five, you, you spend a little bit more in the car, which means naturally that, that would go up a little bit. And it's it's been a great medium for conversion, actually, mm -hmm. uh, funny enough. Um, radio personalities remain celebrities. Yeah, I'm it's, sure it's, it's, it's not that here. You know, the big change, and you can't see it in this, in the last 12 months in the US, the big change has been from radio to podcast. Uh, a lot oh, more yeah, people yeah. are listening to podcasts, uh, but that's powered by everyone having a mobile device with, with a lot data. of data. Yeah. yeah, it's a difference with us. Uh, overseas, so almost every other country, you don't have that. Yeah. So maybe it'll eventually make it through, but yeah, the yeah. podcasts have made, uh, in this in this area, in the NYC metro, two major radio stations closed in the last what year uh, because of the move to podcasts. People are just the same podcast. Yeah, makes sense. Next one to bring this all together. And again, this is US based, but I think er everyone will catch up. Uh, so the big disconnect, and uh, mm -hmm. jump here again. Um, the eyeballs are on digital, right? Yeah. For, for 2018, almost twice more spending on digital. This is ad spend. Uh, so this is media consumption. So this is similar to chart before, but this is, is a, in a percent of overall. Uh, so what percent of your time are you consuming different medias? TV is 36%, digital is 47 and this is old, this is from 2017. Um, the point here though is ad spend still hasn't caught up um, and it's even a bigger disconnect as I've done this uh, internationally. So in the US, the eyeballs are half of your time, you're literally on a digital device and when you're, when you're watching TV, you're still probably on a digital device, right? Uh, ad spend still hasn't caught up. Companies are still spending a lot more money on TV than they are than they are on digital, and I think this disconnect is even bigger internationally. And I think this is where the opportunities lie. We we simply don't have the avenues to spend our digital dollars. There is not we have limited enough, inventory. Yeah, there, there isn't enough inventory in South Africa for you to take a two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar campaign and put it behind digital. It yes. will be oversaturated, and it actually, honestly, digital doesn't convert for us, regardless of yeah. what we do. You can. I don't know, you can do display, you can do whatever you want to do. It just doesn't work. 
Whereas we find with television, number one, you're able to convert. And if you want to sit at the top of the funnel and do awareness, there is no better way for you to do yes. it. You reach, you reach TV, it with reaches, yeah. it's crazy. And yeah. frequency on radio. So we just don't have the yeah. inventory in our country to do it. I think it'll catch up. Mm. <laughs> yes. I think you have yeah. to consider in South Africa as well, the amount of people and the population that has access to smartphones and where yeah. television, radio, newspaper, magazines are still a bigger platform considering yeah. the, the, the... But we don't have the inventory either. You yeah. guys have got so much more than us. Yes. Mm -hmm. if, if I can just add, yes. so believe it or not, people, a couple of years ago, we didn't want to go into the smartphone business. Even though the younger, us younger ones kept on saying, why are we not there? Yeah. Now we're selling more than a million yeah. phones per month at web stores. Mm -hmm. yeah. We sell about 12 million handsets, of which 60% of that is smartphones, and it's the first one that sells up. And we were under the assumption that our demographic is not in the smartphone business. That, oh, but they don't have access to it. So you've now brought it to the people. I think it's data. 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 It's the, the data. data. That's the smartphone in any communities. The data that they just have more access to that. And it's also inventory. We don't oh, have well. yeah. <laughs> the people that we are selling this stuff. As, yeah. as all the consumers get data cheaper, they'll yeah. be That's online the more, and then yeah. your inventory will come yeah. out. It'll yeah. all catch yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just you guys. Europe's also behind on all of this. Uh, it's uh, the same issues with with uh, with data and without data, they don't use the, the mobile devices as much. Without them using it, it's harder for advertisers. It all goes around. Uh, but for me, it's crazy to see such a disconnect. In, uh, and not to say TV is not effective. TV is very effective. Yeah. Uh, it's just the rates in the U.S. that that uh, most channels charge for TV have gone up. They have not gone down. Um, so people are watching it less and the rates are actually flat to up. Um, same for, for all the other sections, e even billboards. So uh, we, ha we have a client who does billboards, so I was looking at their pricing. Over the, the last 10 years, their cost to have a billboard, so they, they put up the, the signs on the mm -hmm. highways. I don't know if it's yeah. common. Yeah. It's yeah. Not that, um, their prices have gone up a little bit. Uh, but if you think about it, they do a lot of billboards in New York, this client. Uh, if you think about it in New York City, 10 years ago when almost no one had a smartphone and smartphones just came out and it wasn't even a thing. People are sitting around in the taxi, right, looking at the billboards. Today, you, see, you get into a taxi, no one's sitting around looking at billboards, right? The tension has dropped, but the prices have gone up. Uh, so not to say billboards are bad or TVs are bad, it's just very important to note these changes. Uh, and it's important to note in the US because I think it'll propagate globally. Um, yes, question. Um, another interesting thing that we can bring in is on TV now, because of Showmax and Netflix and DSTV, and the limited time you have to watch something, you're rather watching on those avenues mm -hmm. without it, so you're not even, you don't even have the time to see it. Yes, yeah. You're watching TV, and there may be a disconnect from the time spent on TV and the ads on TV, because you're actually not watching ads at all. Mm -hmm. Because ads are spam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But still has changed. Trash TV. Still change over the last, especially if, if in the U.S. where that is cheaper. Even if you're watching sports, that when the commercial comes on, people go on their cell phone to like mm, one stop off and talk to a friend. Um, it's, it's yes. So that cheap work, a good point. Is that TV, traditional TV, or traditional? Traditional TV. So, so watching Netflix doesn't even count as Netflix does not count in here. No, Netflix would go into digital, but mm. there's no, there's almost no advertising on, on Netflix, especially when this came around. Um, the last takeaway I have from this is that that literally this is the arbitrage opportunity, and again, you guys are more limited by inventory and a lot of things, but I think. It, You'll get we'll to this get level there, in a couple yeah. of years. Mm -hmm. I think. I think in two, three. This is from 2017. I think you'll in two, three years. You'll be there. Uh, it's important to watch the disconnect because the eyeballs are here, but the spend isn't. Spend is so you still get a much better bang for your buck. Um, I, I won't. I won't waste too much time with this story. But uh, I, I had the story where uh, when when radio just literally was invented uh, after, during during the World War and after it became commercialized and everything, it took a while for people to start advertising on radio. Radio was originally just a broadcast tool. Literally, someone would broadcast their information, people would say, listen. I feel like comparing it to the digital space, it's probably closest to Twitter, right, where you just post into the world and everyone watches. 
Uh, it took a while for anyone to realize this is really a captive audience. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, people would buy these huge radios, like they would be like huge, 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 and they would gather around as a family, they would have dinner, after dinner they would gather around the, as a family around the radio, and they would literally captive audience, they would sit and listen to the radio. And uh, a couple companies realized, wow, we have this captive audience, we should advertise to them. Um, and those companies just did really, really well because no one else was doing it, and it was it, it was so the the attention was there, but the cost was still so cheap. So that's my takeaway with digital. Even though we're approaching 2020, and a lot of people think they've kind of missed the boat, uh, the disconnect is, is still huge. Uh, for our own company, we spend over a hundred thousand dollars every month on our own advertising. We put everything to digital, uh, almost everything into Google, into Google Ads, and. I, I could tell you that today, for every dollar I put into advertising, I'll get five dollars back, lifetime value. So lifetime mm -hmm. value, uh, I'll get five back. Um, this time last year, I would probably put a dollar and got, get five fifty back. Year before, get six dollars back, right? So I, I, I think the gap will close uh, as more people realize that I could take my TV money, put into digital and get a better ROI, I think they'll start closing. But there's still huge opportunities, even in the US. And I think for you guys, you're you're still a couple of years behind this, so you're really could be on top of the ball with this stuff. Question yes. So you've got media consumption for newspapers at one point six percent. Yes. But the ad spend in um, newspapers is ten percent of that. Yes. That's quite an interesting step because it's being consumed so little, but you're still paying the same as you're paying on radio, yes. where the consumption is a lot more. Is that because of uh, the full details again? Because where we come from. A lot of the advertising happens on broad papers, and there's a lot of money that goes into it where the manufacturer picks up those costs. Is it similar? Or is it um, so, not not so much. Uh, so it is. So this that's exactly the, the perfect takeaway from that. Uh, that that shows the magazine, and newspaper advertising is just oversaturated. Uh, a lot of things like this happen when industries are in transition. So the rates. To advertise in newspapers and magazines have not really decreased much over the last 10 years. Consumption like shatter. Like if, if you see pictures of New York City, like people sitting in the subway reading a newspaper, even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you guys like watch any like sitcoms, like Friends mm -hmm. or Seinfeld, right? There, anytime they're in a, a subway, everyone has their newspaper open. I, I, I think I could spend all day writing a subway back and forth. I'm not gonna find anyone <laughs> sitting. You know, you know the big newspapers, like like yeah. literally people would like sit like this. Um, I think it just that that's that's the other that's the flip of digital. Digital, the the eyeballs are here, but the advertising isn't caught up. I think newspaper and magazines is is the opposite. Advertising prices are still too, are are high from from an industry that used to do a lot better, and it just hasn't caught up. And that's why they're they're trying to charge a lot, and some companies are still spending. But that's a, that's why a lot of newspapers, magazines are going out of business, consolidating. Um, it's been the, the industries in, in, in a tough shape because they, they, they haven't caught up. They should be charging a lot less, and the ad spend will then come down to to be equal to the new consumption numbers. Um, it's tough for those industries. I mean, the the play for newspaper and magazines is to become as digital as possible, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Wall Street Journal does it in a very smart way. They let you. They, they put all their content digitally. Mm -hmm. They let you see, I want to say, five articles or yeah. three. How about only three? Yeah, 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 and then you have to pay for it. So they're, yeah. they're trying to make things work, but uh, obviously they internally know these numbers as well. Yeah. They're, they're like, oh shit. I think that's it I have uh, for, for that section. So the next one's going to be about the. Can I go back? Yes. yes. Are you able to give us a list of what the inventory that's available in the States? Yes. Yes. It would be quite interesting to see what we don't have. Like for digital? For digital. Yeah. So I could, I'll, I'll take out my business cards after. Grab yeah. my business card. Um, so I could, uh, I could, even in a much more specific way. If you give me like the keywords, I could yeah. literally tell you the inventory. I also have a lot of tools for even international. So okay. I could estimate. You probably have your own, but maybe I could do some kind of estimate so you don't have access to. It. Yeah. And my last. Yeah. My last bit. Um. In your view, what is the future of owned media platforms for advertisers in in this particular context? Because eventually we become our own publishers, right? And at some point we 
as publishers feel that we don't need publishing houses to spread the message, even from an awareness point of view, because we've done so much work on brand equity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's been a big push toward towards own media platforms, which obviously are not as authentic as um, an own media platform. But what is your view on 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 owned? I, I think that's 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 exactly where it's going to. Um, I think there's still opportunity for things to change. Um, I think there's still there's still opportunity for some kind of disruption to happen, for it to swing another way. Yeah. Uh, but certainly has been has been moving into the direction of uh, publishing, changing a lot. Yeah. Uh, try to see if there's any advice I could give, but I think uh, at this point it just got. When, when advertisers come to going. us, we say we've got a bigger audience than you do. Yeah. We've got bigger eyeballs than you. We've got more yeah. eyeballs than yeah. you. And why do we need? Yeah you to publish our message and then they'll say, yes. ah, let's see if our, our, our audiences look like and it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, can we true. find a way to have an audience that you don't have? And it always in South Africa ends up being about the same audience because we're all targeting the same audience. Yes. Um, and when you sit with a very big owned media platform where you own the data, you understand the consumer, you can see where they are in the journey, advertising to a certain degree becomes uh, redundant. It's the same audience. Definitely. Um, I, I think I think uh, for you guys, you just have a much more limited audience, so you run yeah. into problems like that. But yeah. uh, obviously, no advantage to paying someone more for the same audience Absolutely. that you're targeting already. Absolutely. Question back. Um, so there's an interesting case study um, yeah. from Lush Cosmetics. Yeah. Um, so they're a Polish brand, um, sustainable. We saw them yesterday. Uh, yeah. Um, and they've actually decided to disinvest in all advertising and actually invest that money in their own, own platform media platform yes. because they got tired of keeping up with the, um, the moving algorithms of digital marketing. Mm -hmm. And they were getting frustrated because um, the goalposts were moving so frequently mm -hmm. um, and they were becoming very suspicious of the data. Um, so they cut out advertising entirely and they've invested in their website um, they've invested in their social media platforms um, by creating more engaging content um, they've also invested in other uh, brand extensions like a music recording label, yeah mm -hmm. um, a spa um, and i can't remember the other one but from a production and manufacturing point of view um, which is very bold and I think if you really understand your target market mm. and your consumer yeah. mm. and um, you are more interested yeah. in actually engaging with them in a unique yeah. and uh, authentic way, yeah. they'll always be there. They'll yeah. Yeah. actually do the marketing for you. Yeah. Mm. Um, and also, if you're selling people yeah. what they need, um, you've already won um, yeah. um, the race already. Um, yeah. So Lush does it really well. They even have a catalog, uh, which is not like a traditional catalog, but more of a magazine. And it's got editorial content. Um, it's got um, uh, features on um, all the other things that they are busy with. But then they slot in the price and promo and product in there in not such a very aggressive way as most retailers do. And I think also their key is also the investment in their people. Um, uh, which are also part of their brand custodians um, that influence the customers to purchase. I guess then digital advertising, thanks Andy Lena, mm -hmm. I guess then the role of digital advertising sits at the top of the funnel on awareness. Because if these guys from Lush don't know about Lush, they'll never know about Lush because Lush is important. Mm -hmm. But I think awareness, it's, which is, goes back to Google, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you bid against the words that you want to bid against to get the kind of audience that you want. And then when you do, you draw them to your own media platforms and you keep talking to them forever and a day. I agree. I think a lot of, a lot of the awareness stuff, you don't, a lot of branding awareness stuff I think you could do away with. I think what they did sounds very risky, by the way. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, though, uh, the lower funnel stuff I think you still have to do. For example, if you sell, if you're a company that sells black socks, right? You sell yeah. black socks. Um, you bid when someone searches on Google, I want to buy black socks. They come to your website and you, they buy your black socks. Um, if you're not bidding on that, you're losing that consumer, yeah, they'll click exactly. to your competitor and they'll buy their socks. Uh, yes, you could get away with lowering your social media and doing less display ads and stuff like that, but then they, 
if someone, if you sell black socks and someone's searching, I want to buy black socks, you want your ad there. And the only way to do it is to pay Google, right? Um, I think that you can't miss out on. I, I, I would say you can do away with a lot of digital media. If it's not generating an ROI for you, it's sure will be data driven. If they did the analysis and they said we spent all this money and I know that it didn't make me enough sales, that that's a perfectly fine decision to do. If it's like a gut decision, then that sounds terrible. But um, the the search, the Google search stuff, it's just hard, so hard to get rid of because that's yeah. how the consumer search these days. And as consumers start doing more and more voice searches and mobile searches, you're just not gonna get them anywhere. You could have the most engaging and best website and platform in the world. And if someone literally, all they're gonna do is go, uh, I want to buy black socks and it shows you three ads and they click one of them and buy it they just will never get to your site mm -hmm. voice search also is going to play into this a lot that's a growing mm -hmm. it growing segment in the US not as much uh, worldwide yet but I think they'll catch up also um, a lot of people now have home devices that they talk to and they ask things and that's all powered by search let's further like build the case for what for my question around which should I spend my money it looks like it's, it's going to for have most to of our clients. Uh, so for most of our clients, uh, Google Ads still has the best ROI yeah. out of everything else. I would say, um, I don't want to being tape. I don't want to get in trouble with this. <laughs> but I, I think uh, I would say eight out of ten, maybe <coughs> nine out of ten, get a better ROI from Google oh, Ads so. than anything else. Okay. Cool. So next is we'll actually jump into data and we'll do some more. Uh, Raise your hand type of questions to make sure everyone's still with me. Um, so this is literally the, the questions everyone's been asking the whole time. How do you actually win in this kind of landscape and everything and, and, and we do it through data. So I'll give you two quick slides of what data should be available to everyone here and then we'll do a quick exercise of why it's important to follow. Um, so this is a typical report that we give our clients. So this pulls from Google Analytics. So all of this should be in your Google Analytics if you use it. If you use any other analytic software, it should be very similar. Very hard to see. Let's see if I could. Probably not. Huh? Yeah, I think this is good. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read out for you. So this is a uh, big e-commerce uh, uh, women's young women's fashion company. Uh, they do, I think, 100 million in sales in the last couple of years. Um, but more so here, this is literally data for, for last month. This is a report we generated for them. Um, and there'll be another slide after this. So all of you guys should have all of this. If, if you have a website, definitely use some kind of analytics product. Uh, this pulls from data and uh, from Google yeah, Analytics, uh, yeah. which is super, super powerful for people who have been here with this industry long enough. Um, there used to be a product called, well, to go back 15 years, um, all analytics software is really, really expensive. There was three companies out there that provided it. Uh, one of them was Urchin. I believe their, they sold uh, their their package actually gave you this kind of data for $1,000 a month. So $1,000 you pay per month, no matter how big your website is. Uh, Google came and bought them, renamed it to Google Analytics and made it free. So Google Analytics is really an enterprise level product that you get for free. So uh, there's other options out there that are not bad, but at the very least you should be uh, get using analytics. Uh, so I'll walk through this. So what this shows us is uh, this is what you, everyone should be measuring and making decisions based off of. Um, revenue, RPU is revenue per user. So they know based on all these different metrics how much revenue they get from that individual user. So for example, they know that uh, from people in Los Angeles, they get a much better revenue per user than someone from than people in Florida. So all of this data, uh, not only can you use to make strategic decisions, and we have age over there, um, we use this data to actually feed into Google AdWords. So with the new improvements in Google uh, AI and machine learning, we actually take this data and we feed it into Google AdWords and we adjust how much we bid for the audiences on the fly. So we were able to make adjustments between the time that someone puts in a keyword in Google search and the ad comes up. So in the milliseconds between that, we make adjustments based on this data. And next slide has even more interesting things. Um, day of the week. So we literally know for this for this one consumer, uh, average revenue per user based on the day of the week, hour of the day, device, affinity groups, and market audiences, and all of these could be combined. Uh, they're, they're just presented this way. But for example, we could combine, uh, we know that based on the data, males are more likely to purchase during these hours than these hours. 
And this is not a manual adjustment that's happening. It feeds it through the AI algorithm and happens on the fly. So I don't have to sit there manually and make these adjustments. Uh, but this is literally what helps a company. We've, we've had case studies where they get their, their ROI jumps like triple digits, double, double their, their ROI. Um, just know, and if you have Google Analytics, you should be recording this. So in a lot of cases, people actually have this data, they just don't know they have it, and don't know they could. Oh, what, they, or what to do with it. Or what to do with it, yes. His note, yeah, once again, yeah. yes, yes. And this is literally, even in Google Analytics, you could configure it to say revenue per user. It's literally a direct pull. Um, and then you could line it up against <coughs> affinity groups and audiences. For example, you know, for this specific, uh, a client, I'll show you a picture of their website, women's fashion. Uh, people who travel a lot are actually much more valuable to them than the average consumer. Um, so they could use that to target travel websites and things like that. Lots of really cool data. So this is linked to an e com store, right? This is actually a a affinity store. groups can still be given to you by Facebook, though. If you're yeah, this so this polls this is through Google, but Facebook also has that. Okay. They won't directly but then match they obviously don't give you RPUs because they don't have. That. Uh, Facebook. Yeah. So uh, if you link it up, it'll feed into your Google Analytics. So your Google Analytics can give it to you. This is the, the, this is from Google Analytics. You can have, you now have yeah. market and affinity in Google Analytics. So if you're looking to find a lookalike audience on Facebook from that affinity group, you can take that group, put it into Facebook, and then it'll give you a lookalike audience. Yes, but I think there's a lot of privacy rules about mm. exporting data. Well, well, well if you follow Facebook's data. guidelines. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So if I'm looking for women who love dog, who love to shop for their pets, it's and a lot harder, but it's, it's all these every single data point is uh, is matched to a Google ah, G, G uh, Flip. Okay, okay. Uh, you, there's ways to make that work. Okay. It's much more. It's much easier to link this up and do Google Ads. Yeah. So Google Ads, you could directly target this without doing anything. To get this into Facebook gets tricky. But at the very least, you could see which the, what the groups are and try to find a similar one Group in Facebook. On I Facebook, think. yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that would be the way to go. Okay. Yes, question about um, Is this dashboard um, uh, bespoke to your company, or is it just a screen? Yeah, so this is this is actual dashboard from, from our company that give all our clients, but it pulls uh, with API. So this is uh, what's called Data Studio, Google Data Studio. So. Similar to Google Analytics, Google Data Studio used to be an expensive enterprise product. They actually made it free now. Uh, so you could make really cool dashboards and pull. The, benefit, the, the way we use it is allows us to pull data from a lot of different sources. So these two slides are just Google Analytics. But we actually, for our reports, we pull data from like 10 different sources and match it up. But th this, this exact same views are in Google Analytics. We just, in our report, make it look a little prettier. <laughs> Cool, we're, we're gonna do a quick exercise with this data. So uh, this is literally the, the, the website that we were just looking at the data for. They are a, uh, they are a uh, women's fashion brand, younger, younger, younger women fashion brand. They do, I don't know, can't see from the charts too well, but uh, non-holiday, they do $10 million a month in revenue from their website. Um, traffic's going up and revenues have been going up. They've been doing really well. So the exercise we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the actual data and you guys are gonna tell me who's more valuable to them. So this is, for the first exercise, we have female and male. So raise of hands, who, who thinks, uh, and I'll show you the, the, the website again, although this one's pretty obvious. <laughs> Women's fashion. Who's more valuable to them? Female yeah, audience, right. raise of hands, who thinks this female is more, more valuable to them? Yeah. Almost half the room, male. A third, and then we lost a third somewhere along the way. Uh, so at the at the end of the side, uh, at, the, at the end of the table is uh, conversion rate. So males actually convert a lot higher for them. Yes, they get a lot less for them, right? But and it's not it's it's so much. This is I think a couple of years of data. It's uh, it's any kind of statistical significance that would show up as significance. So. Um, there's there's really a lot of this data analysis that, that everyone should be doing because it's, it's not always obvious, right? You you could look if you didn't do the analysis, you look at the website, you'd be like, I don't even want to advertise to males, right? Yeah. You would stop all advertising to males. Uh, based on this, they actually will convert will convert better, and it makes sense. People buy stuff as gifts and things like that. Uh, but all these decisions should be data driven. If if it if it did say males are worse, you should advertise less, and it should be literally the proportion. You should ca calculate the revenue you make for each, 
and that's how you should spend advertising on a per click basis or whatever basis you do. Um, okay, but then, sorry. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> but then, how do you then advertise to these males who are coming to shop only at for special occasions? And it's not, this is not part of the affinity. They don't do yes. this as part yes. of the daily life <coughs> shop women. They are yes. doing it in special occasions and moments. Yes. What dollar, what dollar value would you spend per male to make yes. sure that you target the right male who's going to shop for her or his wife the day before the birthday? Yes. So I think uh, this, is, this is kind of just to start the thinking. I think it requires further analysis. So my next steps would be to see, broken down by age group, which we're, we're going to do next. Uh, but I would want to see males by age groups because I think that will be also very telling. I don't think you'd want to target all males. I think that age groups would be very important. And I think looking seasonality-wise would be very important. Probably two to four weeks before holidays. Before holidays. And, uh, mm -hmm. There's uh, before maybe other event graduation is a big event in the U.S. There's a time where everyone graduates from college. But I think this is like the beginning of the analysis, and then you got to dig deeper and see actually like if you look at uh, male male conversion rate over time, which you could do in analytics. It'd be this is this is screenshot from Google Analytics. Male conversion rates over time. See if it actually spikes during the holidays, and the rest of the time it's low. Right? I would just blanket start spending more on males, but um, this is the kind of data-driven information that almost everyone should have, and you could really be using to set your marketing apart. Male conversion over time in South Africa, 22, 23, maybe 24, just there about. <laughs> Four fragrances, and then it just drops. Yeah, that this makes is sense. Apparel, hey? This is apparel, women's, women's, young women's fashion. Because yeah. you kept on saying young women, young, and I, I, yeah. I don't know what it's got to do with the ads. Maybe they do. I mean, I, to convince a male to be able to say, yeah. "Trust whatever they advertise, mm -hmm. then I can yeah. buy for my partner or something like that." Maybe they're yeah. good in what they do. Yeah, we we, we work with them, so it's, we're good at no. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do consulting for them, but they, they they do a lot of things very well in general. Uh, same exercise we're gonna do with age. Uh, which group converts the best? Uh, raise of hands for 18 to 24 years old. No, but I think we're starting to lose people. Wait, the price no. um, it's, it's, it's cheaper stuff. I don't know it's if we have prices. Stuff. Yeah, let me see if I can get a screenshot back. I can't see it. Uh, shirts, sure, well, in the US it's different than error, but it's, it's I would say mid market. Uh, $18. I'd say $18 to $24. So this is actually the group they target, which is funny, but uh, mm. obviously I wouldn't have made a slide if one of the other ones were in bigger. Uh, 18 to 24, raise of hands, mm. 1, 2, 25 to 34, yep. yeah. big, big, big uh, percent, that, that was like 70%, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, yeah. <laughs> 1, 55 to 64, 65 plus. 65 plus. That's that's, they don't that's don't have money, so, um, so the, the, the e-commerce conversion rates, again, this is so much data in here. This is all super statistically significant. The best group was 65 plus. Wow. What? what? So they're a small percent of the total <laughs> revenue, they but they are more likely to make a sale. Do they even know how to? To switch it on. These are gifts that grandparents, parents, or... And and yeah, <laughs> yes. Yes. These are Americans. Yeah. Because in South Africa, if you think about it, our grandparents can't afford them. No. It will be different. So they're a worldwide company, but most of their sales are USB. So it's, it will be different for each com uh, each country, each each industry, yeah. but these, you would have to look at these exact numbers. But so they, they, they did actually further analysis and all of this, and not only do they convert better, the older group, they convert a lot quicker. They go to a website and they just buy, right? It, yeah. The younger people, they, they, they leave, they come back, they might not buy, they call sales, the older people go on, they buy, and they're done. But it could be the other way around. It could be a grandchild with a car. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the conundrum, right? Because where do, where do, where do your marketing comms go at any given time? Uh, because your your everything that's geared around your comms has got to do with look and feel, um, you know, age group, who are you targeting, what does it look like, and the rest. And I mean, the pictures that you just showed us two slides ago of that girl with, who's pr yeah. practically not dressed yes. is very very difficult for a grandpa. Yes, to be purchasing to, for to, to purchase, right? 
Well, so you, your, your, <laughs> message, your, message, <laughs> your message needs to be succinct and clear for... This group is small too, even though they convert better, I wouldn't make you the wouldn't worry about advertising to them. So you need them to just convert them yeah. on their own. It's very tough. And then your yeah. comms yeah. 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 goes yeah. towards 25 yeah. to 34. It's, very, it's, it's, it's a good, com it's a good, good question. question. Do you target yeah. your bigger groups yeah. or the yeah. ones that convert yeah. better? Question. Around the conversion rate, so I'm assuming your conversion is a click that becomes a sale. Yeah. So I'm struggling a bit because the revenue for the age 65 plus is only 641,000. So yes, compared no, to the well revenue of the 20,000. Very correct. small group, so you don't get a lot of those people, but you would want those people because they convert better. Mm. And then how do you target them? But I, I understand. Uh, understand. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean that that is actually where mm. your Bigger sales? The biggest sales? No, absolutely no. not. So your biggest sales are actually sitting between your 18 to 18. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Everyone needs it, not just males. Um, and and the, it might be country specific, a lot of this stuff also, but uh, in, the, in the US, for, for them, females are only 12% of the visitors, but the conversion rate is twice more. Same analysis, uh, people, females would also buy a lot quicker. Yes? I think what, what is becoming clear in the data is that uh, direct target marketing, you actually want to redesign depending on what your stats show. Yes. For, the, for the different product types and the lines. Yes. To and get you a could, higher sales rate, to increase the yes. sales rate. And you could segment this, all this data by product line, by product. Yeah. Um, what I want everyone here to kind of take away is that uh, not to make assumptions of the data. Yeah. Like just because I have a fashion site doesn't mean that yeah. I'm only selling to women. Um, all your decisions really need to be data driven. I think five, ten years ago, you could get away with kind of guesstimating. Um, now, especially as bigger companies, so much of it is just so zeroed in and so that driven that everyone has to be, just to be competitive. Yeah. So just another question, just in terms of the data analytics that you're storing at the point of sale, yes. it could be that the woman's using a card and buying it for the man. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, how does, one, how does one look and interpret it? Similarly with the kids and the older parents, because they could just be giving their bank data, but if the, the actual consumer that's driving the buying decision is still a different category. Yeah, so this is uh, this is uh, Google Analytics, so this is Google's data. Uh, it's all e-commerce. Uh, Google has done a really, really good job recently um, differentiating the group. So it's based on literally your Gmail login, based on that they know and all your other activity. But more so in the last, I want to say two years, they start cleaning it up. So they could tell if it's you using your Gmail or someone else if the, the search behaviors are all sudden different. So, and then they'll discount that and there's another category that says like undefined. So they've gotten a lot better with this data and um, it used to be fairly accurate. Now I would say it's very accurate, especially for age and gender. So uh, yes, it could be not perfect. Uh, you could have been logged into your laptop and then someone else jumped on and started using it. Google didn't identify yet that it's a different person. Uh, but it's gotten a lot better, and Google has a lot of third-party data sources that they use uh, to spot check this. We're also not allowed in South Africa to use uh, in-store data for uh, retargeting to e-commerce sites. So data that belongs to the retailer belongs to the retailer, and Acres is a great example of how to protect data. They will not let you, Acres is one of our big department yeah. stores, you are not allowed at any given point in time to use the data that is collected at point of sale to retarget to any e-commerce mm -hmm. site. Um, the e-commerce e consumer remains the e-commerce consumer and if you acquire them in that way then they belong to the brand but if you don't then they, they yes, if basically um, belong less, to so, and That's a very good point. There's a lot of uh, different issues in different countries, yeah. uh, limitations. Uh, you're absolutely right, the way to get around that specific rule is to uh, use the data if it's within the platform. So Google now uh, will measure and report store visits, not necessarily store sales. Yeah, but is the visit linked to an email ID? It is, they keep, they, they, they themselves. So well, it, Google does that, Google but, they, does that. but it's a user rather than a person. It is a user, but they, they will, so it's not perfect, but you will know if a specific user that Google masks, they don't tell you who it is. Absolutely. They visit your store, and then within Google's platform, you could remarket them or market them. Oh, in South Africa, it could be problematic. So Google <laughs> owns that data, so it's not yeah. the store, that's why it's still yeah, allowed. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it makes there, there's a couple of countries it like that, sense. so you, that's how you kind of get around with it, but yeah. I know there's a couple yeah, of countries yeah. that are very strict with yeah. like consumer privacy. Very. Um, same exercise for age. I won't even. I won't even do the raising of hands. Everyone knows all my tricks at this point. Um, also for them, 65 plus uh, uh, had the best conversion rates. And it, it's funny. We, we as a convert. And again, this is conversion rates, not amount of visitors or amount of sales. Because uh, that bucket, the 65 plus, is only 4% of the visitors. 4.61 um, across across all the clients. We see that. Um, the older older brackets. That's which one? The, the worst one I think was literally the younger one. 
Um, the, the older consumers are, are more likely to purchase quicker. They, they uh, shop around less, and, and it's all things that make sense, but it's all the stuff that you really should be thinking about as, as you put together a marketing strategy, and all of this stuff should be really feeding into your marketing strategy. I only have one more slide, and then we'll do, do some more Q&A if you guys have more <coughs> questions. Um, this is for Google specifically, but Google has been uh, pushing out a lot of automation recently, as, as you guys might know. A lot of machine learning, a lot of AI bidding. This is actually an internal slide they have as how they see, how they position themselves as opposed to, so this is where companies like Mindset or any, any advertising agency they work with, but this is how Google sees themselves in this, in this new world, and this is like a future looking slide. Uh, there's more and more stuff, and it doesn't have to be Google, it's literally automated by machine learning. As machine learning and AI becomes a bigger, bigger, a bigger part of your marketing strategy, uh, this is literally how Google themselves see it playing out. They see that the, your advertising agency literally set, sets on top and creates a strategy, sets up the goals, the audiences, uh, creates the assets, and then everything feeds into this automated system that then automatically decides what, what consumer to bid for, how much to bid for, um, and that's where it's all heading for. Because right now, especially in the digital space, you could do a lot of really cool things with targeting. Like you could say, I know I need to target women in this age group and go do it. Uh, but 99% of it is still being done manually right now and it shouldn't be. Uh, for example, we had a client that did very, very well by, by doing hour of day presentations. <coughs> they figured out <coughs> when the best hours are for their business and adjusted all their bidding based on that. Um, and it was a huge change for them and then they actually redid the analysis six months later and it shifted a little bit and they changed it again a little bit. Um, right now, those kind of decisions are being done literally every six months uh, with uh, automation, whether by Google or anyone else, they should really be done on the fly. Everything should be real time. It shouldn't be someone manually sitting there digging through data and being, oh, I need to bid 5% more for women on Saturday. Um, all of it will always be much more efficient uh, with automation, but you still need to actually define your goals. You still need the, uh, the human touch to the deciding the creative, the, the, side, the, the asset of how to actually, what, what the person will see, right? Uh, there's still some override logic that may make sense. So you might, based on the data, it might, make see, it might seem that a lot of your consumers are actually very interested in your products on their mobile. But you might know that actually they don't buy on the mobile. At the end of the day, even though the data shows that they're interested in it, they, for whatever reason they don't, so you, you would take out mobile from the advertising. So there's a lot of value in all of the AI and automation and data. That you, I think the big push in the next couple of years is going to be really all the data everyone's been collecting, AI can now use, right? And like no person in this room, even if you had a staff of 20 people, 100 people, could use all the data you have access to. But all the, all the machine learning and AI computing can. So I think that's going to be a big change, but it's, it's going to be very important to uh, oversee all of that automation that happens. So that's, yes? What is the most, ex in your field, what is the most expensive word um, you put it for? Yeah, uh, so uh, all the insurance stuff in the U.S. is very expensive because the U.S. is very, has laws that favor people suing each other. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of like <laughs> legal. How do I sue? Her? Yes, exactly. Uh, legal, like, uh, Legal, legal words or specifically a uh, car injury attorney, like things like that, because the lawyers make all the money, right? Like uh, all these so things. things like car injury. Attorney. Car, car injury attorney is probably two hundred dollars per click. Yeah. For our own keywords, uh, pay per click management is expensive. One pay per click management, PPC management, I think is eighty dollars now, ninety dollars per click. Um, it's all it's all marketplace, so yeah. it's literally uh, it's as expensive as people are willing to pay for. It. Yeah, there's all the, it's fine, you could Google, you could literally Google uh, top top uh, keywords, most expensive keywords on Google. Uh, I, I bet that the majority of them would be attorney, insurance attorney insurance, legal related. Yeah. But it's definitely, so when I started my first company in, in 97, I remember I started running Google Ads uh, a couple years after when, when it just came out. And I remember I was spending five cents for someone searching web hosting. And, now? and I was like, that's so expensive. And I stopped <laughs> it. I'm like, this is such a waste of money. Five cents on a single click? I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> now I think it's like $25 or something. Yeah, it's, uh, 
Uh, you can't do five cents even if you wanted to. And I don't know if it's yeah, international, but the, the minimum, the minimum uh, in the U.S. might be international too. For Google, is ten cents now, so you can't even do five cents even if you wanted to. But I remember I stopped it. I'm like, it sounds good. so. It's, it's all it's all relative, and all the decisions should be data driven. At that time, from the five cents, I was getting an ROI. But to me, at that time, uh, literally in the late '90s, when the internet just came around, paying that much for a click to your website just seemed ridiculous. So. Um, Come, it's come a long way. Uh, so ad blockers in most cases don't block Google searches. Um, and uh, for Google, it's a lot of literally the consumers looking for your product. That's why it works so well. Like literally on, 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 on Facebook, I get a lot of the difference between Facebook and Google, right? On Facebook, uh, you, you want to find a specific audience and then show them your ad a lot and hope that they're interested in your product at that time when you show it. Um, on Google, people are looking for you, so, so you, meant, you, you have purchase intent. You know someone's searching, I want to buy black socks, you know they're going to buy black socks, right? On Facebook, you're like, I think this person might buy socks, let me keep showing them the banner. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, ad blockers, there, there's always a battle with ad blockers and advertisers, right? Every time ad blockers block a format, a new format comes up, uh, luckily pop-ups went away, pop-ups were very big, big for a while. Um, but I think ultimately uh, media consumption has been moving more and more towards Google search and Facebook, which isn't really affected by ad blockers as much. Um, there's still a lot on the, on the display side, all the, all the websites, but I think it's, I haven't seen a huge change year over year that all of a sudden there's an impact. I think every time, every time ad blockers <coughs> become more popular, or now I think they're, they, either Chrome or Firefox is rolling it out by default in some way. Um, the advertising industry just changes that a little. So it's always, I, I don't think there's been a dramatic change either way. I think that was my last slide, but I could put this up. Um, I think that my information's we'll do We'll do Q&A, but I think I like the first slide more than the last slide. That's the slide to leave it on. You can see all the slides really quickly now. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, if you guys want to reach out to me online, I'm, uh, I use all the social media platforms, but Twitter I use the most, and LinkedIn I think is the most popular for, for networking, so feel free to add me, follow me, and I'll open it up to more questions if anyone has any. And I'll put out my business cards up front. If you guys want to grab one after, feel free to reach out to me if there's any follow-up questions after that. In your view? Yes. <laughs> yeah. In your view, yeah. who's getting it right, digital advertising wine? In the state. Um, so prior to starting this company, uh, Smart Sites, um, I spent three years at MediaVest, which is part of Publicis, uh, working at Samsung and Walmart. Yeah. Um, I think, and the reason I left that position and started this company is, uh, I think a lot of very big companies get it right just because they have the money, the money. to uh, both spend and experiment. Uh, for a small business, uh, they have their advertising budget and that's it. Like they can't experiment with it. If they experiment for three months and they get no results, they'll go out of business. So I really saw very powerful things being done by the Fortune 50 companies, not even 500. Um, and I started this company to try to provide those services to companies that don't have access to that. Uh, so in terms of who's getting it right, the bigger companies always have a natural advantage just because they have more money and because they could experiment more and they have they have like extra money to, to, to go around and test things. Um, so uh, I think I think the bigger companies uh, do it better, but at the same time they're less agile. Um, they're less, they're slower to move strategies. So I think the advantages for the small, medium-sized businesses or anyone who's not a Fortune 50 company or a 500 company is uh, the agility that you could move around a lot quicker. And I think I've seen a lot of smaller companies perform a lot better than their bigger counterparts because they are quicker to respond to changes. And that's a big thing. The bigger you become as a company, the slower you move, right? Any kind of like market change. Or, like so so that's, that's, that's your competitive advantage as, as, a, as a smaller guy. You don't have the access to all the resources and, and all the uh, marketing and, and uh, Maybe even a talent pool, but you have the agility. And the smallest budget you've worked on? We we work with that, but we do we do a lot of small businesses. I think for online marketing, 
uh, we start at uh, Google budget at 1,500 a month, 1,500. So we have a we have a lot of small medium sized businesses. So you'd be surprised. We, we work with a lot of like the we work with a lot of like the final holdouts of the internet age, and uh, we have a very good relationship with Google. And one of the reasons is we get these people into the internet age. So the 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 one one person companies, the the roofing guy, right? Like he all he, all he makes his roofs. He was he's been fixing roofs for three generations. His father, his grandfather never needed any marketing because it was all referral like friends and yeah. family right? and all of a sudden he's like i'm not getting any business he's like my family's been doing this forever he doesn't have a website he's on google people go search on google now instead of asking their uh their their friends or family i've seen it's such a crazy shift and, and a lot of it's cultural so you might see stuff that's different but I've seen so many cases where maybe 20 years ago someone would ask their parents for a suggestion yeah. it was very accepted like a plumber or any mm -hmm. kind of service, mm -hmm. like you'd go to your to your parents and ask them. People don't do that anymore. The younger generation just goes online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's such a huge it's change. Funny. So mm -hmm. we deal with a lot of SMBs, small businesses that literally are the last holdouts of the digital age. We make them a website, start to do Google Ads for them, amongst other things. Yes. Um, what would you say are some of the key skills um, and expertise that a marketing professional or a marketing-centric organization needs to start investing in to um, future-proof themselves? Good question. Um, I, think, uh, I think being very cognizant of data and, uh, and data analytics is much more important now than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, and I think that'll continue to be a focus. Looking into the future, what's going to be important, uh, data is still going to be number one. Uh, it, data is going to drive marketing, it's going to drive everything going forward. Um, being able to use that with AI and machine learning is going to be big, so you just have to be cognizant of all that, all that upcoming, literally, the data has to feed into something they'll then make changes. That, that mm -hmm. something still doesn't really exist, it's yeah. still being worked on, uh, but you have to be really cognizant of it. But if you think about it, 10 years ago, and you, you do, you do uh, marketing, advertising, uh, what metrics did you, or data did you really have to go on? In, in the US, in the print industry, they would charge you based on how many magazines they print. They that's, print. Why, <laughs> that's why if you walk around New York City, they have stacks of newspapers on the street because mm -hmm. literally that's how they charge. It's based on printing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all that gets measured. There's no, there's no like the, all the data we looked at. Literally, yeah. you have number of, number of print, oh. printed copies. Uh, for TV, you had Nielsen that really dominated the space to put boxes in select people's houses, a couple thousand people. And based on that, they would project out 350 million population, right? Um, that's the data you had to go by. So you didn't really need to have anyone that was really like a, a data scientist or into data analytics because the data wasn't there. there the numbers weren't there. Um, I think going forward, I think the last five years have been an overload of data, maybe the last 10 years, that you really have all this data, but you don't know really what to do with it. And you didn't need to, right? Yeah. It was just like you collect the data, you know that this age group does better, and like you really don't need to do anything with it. I think the next 10 years is really you have to start applying it. I think uh, if you don't, you'll be at a disadvantage and uh, keeping up with all the machine learning and AI is gonna be huge uh, because it, like I was saying, it was one thing to manually adjust for all these things that we talked about every six or months or whatever your interval is versus the machine learning doing it on the fly every 10 seconds or whatever it is, it's gonna be a huge change. So uh, looking into the future in terms of what you would need a company to have in a company, uh, both, I guess, talent and infrastructure. I think it's, it's collecting of data, analyzing of data, and machine learning. Any other questions? Yes. So we, we're seeing a shift towards um, a personalized shopping experience yes. using the data and artificial intelligence. <coughs> Do you see a drive in that direction from a marketing perspective as well, uh, like on the digital platform where it becomes individualized or personalized marketing? Yeah, so great question. So almost two different, uh, you can almost separate it in half. Uh, the experience a consumer expects to have on, uh, on the website and the e-commerce experience versus what they expect from the advertising. Um, 
I could tell you that uh, we're getting to a point where ads could be super personalized. Um, if you if you guys ser search around, there was a funny case study this this guy did uh, I think a couple of years ago, but he created an audience uh, on Facebook of one person, his roommate, and then he started showing his roommate like specific ads about him. Like it would be like make your bed, like right. Dad would say it would be like literally to the uh, the, the audience of one. Um, we're getting to a point where you could do a lot of really cool stuff like that. I think that the consumer doesn't demand it yet, like they demand a personalized shopping experience, but at the same time, I think that consumers are um, less scared of it. I think three years ago, if I went to a website and the banners on top said, like, Alex, do this, like it was personalized to me, I would get like really freaked out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Turn the computer off, right? Yeah. And like, I imagine like my grandma seeing something, I should like toss the computer out the window. <laughs> um, but I think now, in moving forward, uh, people are starting to be okay with that. So I don't think they necessarily want that or, or demanding it, but it's becoming almost accepted norm. Like, I wouldn't get freaked out, I think, if I saw a banner that had my specific name. Because I know all the data exists there. I know, I know Google has all my data, and I think in this day and age, just using the internet, you have to accept that your data is out there. Um, it'll definitely be used for custom, very custom marketing stuff. I think so, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's Diskim, one of our pharmaceutical kind mm -hmm. of companies. What do they call that? Pharmaceutical Diskim. Uh, they've actually just launched some of the IE where they on the shelving. Mm -hmm. they, they're using quite a lot of data that they've gathered. Um, and what they found like with the black male wearing a, um, what's it, armor guard or something, armor? Under, under, under armor, under armor. Yes. Uh, typically most people that are coming in at a certain night certain age group also wears this so now they double marketed their products mm -hmm. so every time you walk past and it sees that you are male it will mm -hmm. play them the ad specifically for you as the female walks past yeah, it plays the female ad so it's i think we'll probably go to that stage a yes. lot easier in the beginning that will now prepare yes. us into the individualized marketing but those things are existing already in our south african environment and retailers that's not on board quick enough are going to lose out yeah and it makes sense it's all that relevancy right how many ads do i see per day on tv that have nothing to do with me yeah. a lot it's a waste of their money every time uh, those ads come up some advertisers are losing money because they paid to show that ad to me and it has nothing to do with me um, digital just empowers you to avoid wasting money like that as much as much as possible. So for sure, I think it's going to be uh, maybe not. It might take a couple of years for for my example to have like my name everywhere. Yeah. But uh, at the very least, gender, age, those are such yeah. th easy things to segment. That uh, uh, for sure, I, I keep seeing I keep seeing uh, pharmaceutical ads uh, on TV for like for like medicine for older age groups like that doesn't apply to me whatsoever and i know they're expensive too they're like running during prime time tv expensive ads There's, someone's wasting money on that i think uh, ads are going to become definitely more more relevant and targeted any more questions yes the consumer what privacy privacy, privacy. privacy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's uh, very country specific in general. Um, I think in the U.S., consumers have a lot less privacy. Uh, in, in, in Europe now, there's in Europe they're being a lot stricter. Stricter. Um, I think a lot of it has been kind of a knee-jerk reaction mm. to such a huge change. Yeah. Um, especially a lot of the older population that's making these laws, uh, for them it just seems very crazy. For a younger generation, very few in the younger generation really feel like they're, they're giving up anything online, right? But you are. Anytime you go online, you give up all your information, absolutely all your information. Um, I think, uh, I think there, there's been a lot of privacy concerns in the laws recently. I think uh, in the next 10 years, they'll ease up as uh, the generation who grew up in this space uh, gets older and gets into a position of people who make the laws. Um, uh, my, my take on it might not be the same as everyone else's. I, I, I fully embrace the idea that if I go online, I 
have no more privacy, right? And a lot of people still like hang on to the idea that I want all the benefits of the internet, but I want to stay completely anonymous. Um, so, so, so what's the use of, of you clicking on privacy and security? <coughs> It, it, so it's uh, I keep on prompting you to, to, to yeah so especially in Europe there's a lot of things you you're, you're you have to accept their privacy laws and statements uh, the I'll generalize it because every country is specific but generally uh, you're you're accepting the terms they outline there that they'll do their best to keep your information private and you won't resell your information directly um, <laughs> if they, right, if they, that's what I say. But if they use Google Analytics on the on their on their website, which they probably do, they're already indirectly reselling your information to Google. Um, there's a reason Google Analytics is free. Yes. Obviously, with uh, the amount of acquisitions and stuff, so information is not private. It goes into no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, I, I, again, my opinion might not be the most popular one, but I accept the notion that if I want all the benefits of the internet, I have to give up my privacy. I'd, I'd like for my identity not to be stolen or my credit card not to be stolen. I do my be best for, not, for that not to happen. But in terms of going to a website and the website knowing my gender and age, I, no. I'm, I accept that. I, I assume that the, to, to some extent. Um, I think a lot of recent laws try to protect the consumer, which is good. I have, I have nothing against protecting the consumer. Uh, but I think people will, will get used to uh, get used to it. At the end of the day, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of benefits to the internet the way it exists today. It's very hard to say I want all the benefits, but I want to remain completely private and not give up any information. But also, it's no longer about your email address. It's about your psychographic it's and your behavior. Mm -hmm. There are so many people that are similar yes. to you that I can target. If I know what you like, what you don't like, you build a how you be, how you behave, I build a lookalike audience. Eventually, the message is going to get to you. So people are so worried about. The personal information like your phone number and your email address yes, and your not, ID. It's no longer about that. It's, it's about not that someone's downloading. A group of people that think in a particular way, that behave in a particular way, and as a result, there isn't one of you, believe it or not. There's many of you that think in so, a similar way. As an advertiser, I'm completely fine with that, but I, I know a lot of consumers that are very concerned. Oh, okay. one, of, one of the questions in South Africa we've got before the public. Mm. In terms of privacy. So how do you guys manage that? Do you have a similar? I'm sorry. In South Africa we have what is that? It's, it's, it's about okay, it's okay. okay. Gotcha, gotcha. So how, how do you guys manage that? So for our, our advertising we don't store data of any kind. We don't need to. Yeah, you don't need to. Uh, Google does it on uh, third party sources do it. Third party carries all the Google. Yes. We don't we don't store data of any kind or for anything either. Uh, in the U.S., they're similar. There's, uh, it's, it's in the U.S. Uh, it's mostly applied to the medical field. There's a lot of laws of uh, what you can store and can't store in medical, anything medical related. Uh, but uh, from advertising standpoint, we don't need to store anything. So it makes it easier for us. But I, I, in Europe, it gets a little trickier. Right now. But even even Europe, from an advertising standpoint, you don't need to store any of your own data anymore. You used to. Right, ten years ago, that's that's how Oracle became the company it is. Oracle specialized in helping companies store tons of data. Uh, but these days, not only do you not need to, you should do your best to not have to. Because if you're storing all this data and then get hacked and then gets exposed, you're going to be in a very big mess. Yeah. So, so we've got a challenge at the moment. Um, articles are still coming in. So, software as a service yes. in terms of. So we don't have the infrastructure yet, and hopefully in the next two years or so we will. So it's still become quite a, a challenge, and we are actually forced to store your own data on-prem. So hopefully in two years' time that will start migrating more, because I mean, ideally you want to specialize in what you do. And if not, you're not, a, not and, be an IT company. And not be an IT company, <laughs> which at this stage we unfortunately forced yes. to do. I, I think that's the exact same place where many companies in the U.S. were maybe eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, you literally had to be your own IT company. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it'll, it'll change, and uh, not just South Africa, uh, Europe is not that far behind, but a lot of countries similarly. A lot of companies I talk to there literally are their own IT companies, and they just everything, everything stored locally, and just yeah. uh, not caught up. Yeah, it's crazy. So part of the challenge is also understanding all of the files that are required 
uh, especially when moving into a cloud base. And so a lot of that skills we don't have at the moment, yeah. which is also quite a big challenge. Yeah. So our IT teams are having to learn all of these things as yeah. we progress. And it becomes painful lessons. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a painful process. <laughs> Uh, but I think I think it'll happen. After that, it'll be a lot easier. It'll be a lot easier. Yes, question. Um, I'm trying to recall now. Have you always been on the agency side in terms of your work experience? Um. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 Did you work for Oh, you were on the agency side. Yeah, oh, yeah, you worked for, on the yeah, Samsung publicist. Yeah, I was a oh. yeah, publicist. There, there, I had a couple of uh, short, short stays and uh, stints in, 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 in not on in the agency side, but uh, most of my experiences agency side, the businesses I've run, and all the businesses that I work with. Uh, so, because my question was going to be around how um, the strategic business relationship between clients and agents oh. has been impacted by digital migration. Um, I haven't seen much of an impact. So at Publicis, I was there 10 years ago, and I got to see uh, their traditional agency that now does a lot of digital. Um, I got to see their relationships at that time, and I, I, I know how they work now. Um, I think similar to almost every other industry, there's a lot less loyalty mm -hmm. um, on that side. Uh, companies would stay with an agency like forever. They would sign like 10-year deals and then resign them. I think much, much more shopping around that happens yeah. now. I think mostly because of digital, because it's so easy to research other companies and. Uh, all of that, but I don't think the relationships have changed that much. I think it's still a lot of it is literally relationship holding and building. So regardless, uh, and this is I'm going to like personal opinions, but from the from the big agencies I've seen and even the smaller ones, uh, I've seen a lot of cases where even if the agency doesn't perform well, uh, they have a good relationship. They'll stay with them. So a lot of it's still relationship building. That's old school. Yeah. Relationship building and keeping is old school. It's not like the internet age, right? In the internet age, uh, young consumers don't value that as much. So I don't think it's shifted much yet. Uh, but there's definitely less loyalty. Digital age just brings a lot more information to people. I think that in a lot of times, the consumers are more educated. Uh, 10 years ago, I can't imagine anyone at Samsung calling up Publicis and like, talking about conversion rates and like A-B mm -hmm. testing and like all these things. Uh, I think the internet brought a lot of education to everyone and at, at every level within uh, a company now, uh, even, even like the CEO of a company could, could go online and learn <coughs> about like digital trends and then call the agency and ask them about it. I think that's all new. Before like you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a library and try to learn that, it just it was, it was too cumbersome. So I think that's, that's one of the big changes I've seen. But, Nothing, nothing dramatic. Any more questions, comments, topics? Yeah, you're all good. Feel mm -hmm. free to grab a business card after and reach out if there's anything I can help with. Well, I oh, get. You can follow me online, of course. Go to smartsites.com, alexmellon.com. Um, would you just, yeah, yeah there you go. You see everybody, the slides are on my computer already. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lydia. You're welcome. Yeah. When you say it this time. <laughs> <laughs> Alex? Okay. Yeah, j j just yeah. before we go, just on behalf of the group, we would like to thank you for your time today and the effort you've put into the presentation. Many of us are future le leaders within our organizations, and today we've seen a picture of the future, and this helps us create a roadmap for our various organizations on how to win in a sector that is still fairly new within our markets. Yeah. So for that we say thank you. Um, in closing, just to also say that we came with great expectations to America. And this presentation has certainly met mine and I'm sure many judging by the discussions today. So you've met and exceeded what we expected. So thank you for that on the offering of Thank you. Very much. Thank you.